Hi, this is Greg Gornert of Gornert Wealth Management, and this is my Insights and Perspectives podcast. Welcome to the September 15th episode of my Insights and Perspectives podcast. In this mid-month business toolkit episode, we'll be focusing on protecting your wealth, and I'll be joined today from New York by Canaccord Genuine Chief Equity Strategist, Tony Dwyer. Tony, I saw a couple of weeks ago on CNBC that they're now uh, running a, a Tony Dwyer recession doomsday clock after the yield curves inverted. <laughs> I thought it was a funny thing that I didn't know they were going to do. Since I'm talking to Tony, I've got some awesome bonus content. I've included a link in the description page to Tony's latest extensive research piece on the state of the markets today. You can also find it on my webpage, greggornert.com. That's G-R-E-G-G-O-E-R-N-E-R-T.com, where you can also find links to all my other newsletters, interviews with previous guests, and material that every business owner and investor needs to have. So now, let's get to the interview. Joining me today... From New York is Canaccord Genuity Chief Market Strategist, Tony Dwyer. Welcome, Tony. Hey, thanks for having me, Greg. Hey, Tony, I, I saw a couple of weeks ago on CNBC that they're now uh, running a, a Tony Dwyer recession doomsday clock after the yield curves uh, inverted. Why don't we talk a little <laughs> bit about it? Um, we've been, you've been talking about the yield curve and, and, uh, and that playbook for, for years now. Now, we have had the 2 to 10 yield curve go inverted. Where do you see things going from here? Maybe to expand upon those thoughts a bit. So the doomsday clock was really a funny, I thought it was a funny thing that I didn't know they were going to do. And ultimately, once you make the initial date of the inversion of the two-year and 10-year yield curve, it basically is an indication that down the road, lending is going to shut down and money availability is going to shrink. And that's what ultimately creates a recession. Now, what's important about that is it, ta- it works with a very big lag. So unlike many other people that say, uh-oh, the yield curve inverted, we're about to go into recession, there's no data that really supports that, especially in a giver, given, uh, the, given the current levered environment. So it, it, the reason that it works with lag is you get a dramatic drop in the 10-year no yield, which actually acts as a stimulative effect on economic activity. So what we've seen is the Fed hasn't lowered rates enough but actually, what all the lending rates are based on is the non-Fed part of the yield curve. The so the mortgages in the U.S. have dropped significantly. So what, what's happened is we were in this situation where everybody's fearful of the trade war, and they, they should be. There's clearly signs of a global economic manufacturing uh, recession and fear-based period based on the, the trade war with China. Although the offset to that, people never talk about the offset, Greg, as you know. It's always the negative because that's what sells. But the offset to that is that slowdown in global growth and manufacturing has caused such a drop in interest rates in the U.S. that it's allowed for so many people to refinance their, not just people, but people and companies to refinance their debt. So what we think is happening is that we've had, you know, people keep waiting for the recession and the 210 uh, inversion means that it is eventually going to happen probably two to three years away. Um, but what we've had this cycle is what I'll call three mini recessions. A mini recession is uh, almost getting the U.S. to a recession level, but not quite getting there yet the market prices it in. So if you think back to the European debt crisis of 2011-2012 or the commodity crisis with China and the rest of Asia in 2015 and 16, you saw a near 20% drop in the S&P 500. And yet you did not go into recession. The long-term end of the, uh, the yield curve, meaning the 10-year note yield, dropped from over 3% all the way back down to under 1.5%, almost exactly what's happened this cycle. Yet the U.S. didn't go into recession, so that the stimulative effect on lending of that drop in interest rates kick-started the consumer and economic activity. That appears to be happening again today. And what we've noticed in our research is heading into the the low in the 10-year bond yield in the, both of those two mini-recession environments, coming out of that low, which we think was just September uh, 3rd on the 10-year, mm-hmm. coming out of that low, the more offensive sectors were the place to be. So we're, we're really constructive still for our 2000, with our 2020 S&P 500 target of 3350 
Um, we think it's going to be led by the offensive or more cyclical sectors, and that's going to be the driving force rather than just the trade war. Interesting. Now, now we've been talking in the past, and you've been t- just talking about corporate credit issuance that's still very strong out there right now. Um, and so that seems to be coming together. But you've also got this, um, this push-pull in the Fed. Like a few weeks ago, we had Bill Dudley come out. You know, I mean, that's a former chair, vice chair, sorry, of the, uh, the New York Fed, you know, talking about countering Trump's policy. Uh, that does lead to a lot of uncertainty there. Where, where do you see the Fed in all this? Is, is the Fed becoming more politicized, or do you think it's affecting their thinking? Well, but, so what's, what's really been happening is the Fed is supposed to follow the level of inflation. They want a 2% average level of inflation, yet the core personal consumption expenditure index is 1.6%. So you're well below where the Fed wants it to be. And they've been hesitant to lower interest rates following the bond market, and many think because... Donald Trump has been bashing them over the head. Mm -hmm. So that had created an environment where the the rest of the bond market acted like they were going to cut rates, but the Fed didn't do it. What happened a couple of weeks ago is Bill Bill Dudley, the former um, vice chairman of the Federal Reserve, now that he's out of office, sent in an op-ed to Bloomberg saying that Donald Trump is the biggest risk to the U.S. economy long term, and the Fed should consider that when making policy decisions. And that just, that is the most insane thing I've ever heard. You know, and then yeah. he tried to back, walk it back a week later, and all he did was dig the hole deeper. So the, the bottom line is now the Fed has to prove, he really put his old friend Jerome Powell in a box, because now he's got to prove that he's not, the Fed has got to prove that they're not out to get Donald Trump, and they're not themselves political. Right. So what you've done is you've neutra- neutralized the politicization of the Fed, and now they can go back to what they have, which is low inflation that's too low, an ECB that is dramatically lowering rates and doing quantitative easing again, and a Bank of Japan that'll buy anything that has a symbol. So there's, there's, uh, we're in a very stimulative environment here. So, so you think the upshot of, of that op-ed might turn out to be moving back to a more data-driven Fed, which is the whole point to begin with? Am I getting you there? It's exactly, that's exactly what our opinion was two weeks ago, um, which we conveyed to our clients, as you know, um, when Bill Dudley wrote that op-ed. That's exactly what our thought was, that that neutralizes the political side. There is no political side of the Fed. That neutralized the perception that there might be. Perception, that's a and good point. And that was a very a important point. point, which allowed for upset. Okay, so now that we've got... We're move, you're, you're saying that we should be moving to a more aggressive stance. Institutionally, I, uh, you know... I've been seeing a lot of people on on the defensive side of the trade right now. Uh, are you starting to see some movement away from defensive into the uh, uh, the more you know active sorry aggressive part part of the portfolios right now? Is that the rotation that we're beginning to see? Over the prior to um, as you guys as you know, Greg, I don't like to put my opinion in it. I like mm-hmm. I like to put data into it. Right. And so what. Um, what we found is in the other two quote unquote mini recessions of the last 10 years that we've had, again, the European debt crisis and then the Chinese commodity crisis. Once you made the low in the 10 year note yield, which we believe you did last, uh, last this current September 3rd, then the sectors that perform the best over the next 12 months and even up to the next peak in rates is cyclical sectors, meaning um, the, finan- the offensive sectors, the financials, the industrials, um, infotech, um, tele- some of the more cyclical healthcare companies, that kind of, that kind of focus. It's more about cyclicality than defense. Okay. Now, something I've, I've been thinking about and I wanted to ask you your thoughts on is that I mean, we've got negative bond rates throughout the world right now. And that's got to change things a little bit. And the other thing that I wanted to ask a little bit, this seems to be, in my mind, one of the most widely anticipated recessions. You know, I've been in the business 25 years where that, that's out there. Now, I know that doesn't avoid a recession, and I'm not saying that at all, but because it's so anticipated and we've got negative bond rates, is that, in your mind, does that change the nature of the recession that, that will come? Um, because I know it's well, all based on credit it rates. It could. It could delay it. But ultimately, you're going to shut down money. Right, right? exactly. It's, 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 the banks aren't incented to lend by an inversion of the yield curve. They're not going to provide money once they stop providing money. 
that's going to shut down uh, the levered engine. But that said, we've already had a 20% drop. We had 19.8% drop in the S&P 500 mm-hmm. by the uh, by Christmas Eve last year. So, you know, when people are so fearful of a recession that's already been discounted, has been our point since last December. No, it, it, exactly. And you've got a relatively long, actually quite a long time, like between the inversion right now and, and a potential recession. So that, I mean, that's... I mean, two or three years is a long time. Uh, over two years. Yeah, that's a that's a long time in, well, in the market. Well, that is over the last three cycles. Over the last three cycles, the lead, the from the initial date of inversion at the two ten curve, the S P five hundred has gone up a median thirty four percent over twenty two months, with a recession not taking place for two years. So. You know, that's just the data. That's not our opinion. Right. I like data better. Well, you know, that gives me a, a real good thought of what, where your thoughts are at right now. Now, going forward, so right now, as far as positioning for equity portfolios, you would be risk on moving from the defensive sectors into the more offensive sectors. That's our call. Thanks so much for joining me today. I uh, love your insights as usual. Have a great day. Have a great day. Thanks again, Greg. Hey, thank you. Bye. Hey, thanks for listening. Don't forget to subscribe and visit us at our website at greggorner.com. That's G-R-E-G-G-O-E-R-N-E-R-T.com. Thanks again.